In today's video, we'll be discussing synaptic transmission. After watching this video, you should be able to do the following three things. First, identify and draw the main types of synapses found in the nervous system. Second, you should be able to describe the mechanism of synaptic vesicle release. And finally, you should be able to describe how neurotransmitters can cause a change in postsynaptic membrane potential. In the last video, we talked about how an action potential is propagated down an axon. In some cells, this action potential can propagate to the next neuron through gap junctions, as shown here. These gap junctions allow electrical connectivity between two cells so that current and ions can flow directly into the postsynaptic cell. More typically, though, we think of neurons communicating together through chemical means by the release of neurotransmitters from synaptic vesicles. You can see in this electron micrograph, here's your presynaptic bouton here, and you can see the synaptic vesicles. This presynaptic bouton is making two synapses onto two postsynaptic neurons, as shown here. Synaptic vesicle releases neurotransmitter, and it acts on receptors on the postsynaptic side. A typical neuron makes about 1,000 synapses with other cells and receives from anywhere from 10,000 to over 100,000 synapses itself. So it's not usually a one-to-one, -one, one single neuron synapsing onto another single neuron. There's a lot of integration that goes on in the cell. There are three main types of synapses in the nervous system. The axodendritic synapse, shown here, where the axon from the presynaptic cell synapses onto the postsynaptic dendrite. Second, you have an axosomatic synapse, the axon from the presynaptic synapses onto the soma or cell body of the postsynaptic cell. And finally, you have an axoexonic synapse, where the axon of the presynaptic neuron synapses onto the axon of the postsynaptic neuron. In addition to the different anatomical lo locations of these synapses, they also have some functional differences. In general, most of your axodendritic synapses are excitatory. Most of your axosomatic synapses are inhibitory, and most of your axoaxonic synapses are modulatory. That means that they alter the amount of neurotransmitter that's released from their postsynaptic cell. Some of the axodendritic synapses synapse onto specialized structures on the dendrite called dendritic spines. These dendritic spines provide a postsynaptic microenvironment for synaptic transmission to occur. This microenvironment has been implicated in synaptic plasticity as well as learning and memory. Unlike the cell soma or dendrites, the axon and presynaptic bouton do not contain ribosomes, so local protein synthesis cannot occur. This means that the presynaptic bouton and axon rely on transport from the soma. Many things are transported from the soma to the presynaptic bouton including the neurotransmitters that will be released through the synaptic vesicles, mitochondria, receptors, cytoskeletal elements, as well as cytosolic proteins. This transport is a two-way street, though, because some things must be transported from the presynaptic bouton back to the soma. This includes things like proteins for degradation, the mitochondria, as well as growth factors. Transport along the axon requires the use of motor proteins. There are two main motor proteins involved. Each of these can only travel in one direction down the microtubule. Kinesin is a plus-directed motor protein, and it takes its cargo from the soma to the presynaptic bouton. Dynein goes the reverse direction. It's a minus-directed motor protein, and it goes from the presynaptic bouton back to the soma. Synaptic vesicles are formed in the presynaptic terminal or bouton. The synaptic vesicles are pinched off of the multivesicular complex. These vesicles have two important proteins, synaptobrevin and synaptotagmin, and are loaded with neurotransmitter. These vesicles then move to the active zone where the core complex is formed, which allows the vesicles to dock in the active zone and get ready for the signal to release neurotransmitter. Now, there are three important 
proteins that you should know that form this core complex and allow vesicle docking. The first is synaptobrevin, which is on the vesicle itself, which we talked about before, and the second two proteins are found on the active zone membrane, that's SNAP25 and syntaxin. And again, together this complex is called the core complex. Depolarization of the presynaptic bouton causes the opening of voltage-gated calcium channels. Calcium can then flow into the cell and bind onto synaptotagmin. This catalyzes membrane fusion, so the synaptic vesicle fuses with the membrane and then opens up to release neurotransmitter. The fact that calcium is necessary for presynaptic vesicle release can be shown by this experiment. You take a presynaptic neuron and place it in a zero calcium bath, so no extracellular calcium. You put a stimulating electrode into the presynaptic cell and a recording electrode on the postsynaptic cell. Okay. If you then stimulate the presynaptic cell, shown here, so you can see that little blip, that's your presynaptic uh, action potential or stimulation, you have no calcium. You also record on the postsynaptic cell no EPSP or no change in membrane voltage. So even though the presynaptic cell has been depolarized, since no calcium can flow through those voltage-gated calcium channels, you'll get no change in postsynaptic membrane potential. If instead you puff a bit of calcium with this electrode right before you stimulate the presynaptic cell, now you can get an EPSP or membrane voltage change on your postsynaptic side. If you wait and puff that calcium until after the presynaptic cell has been stimulated, so by now the voltage-gated calcium channels are closed, you still get no postsynaptic membrane potential change. So if we measured calcium permeability, or how many calcium channels are open, as you increase the depolarization on the presynaptic cell, you will increase the number of calcium channels that are open. Okay, this makes sense, they're voltage-gated, so you depolarize the presynaptic bouton because your action potential has come down, you're going to open those voltage-gated calcium channels and let calcium in. As you increase the amount of calcium inside the cell, inside the presynaptic cell, you also increase the amount of neurotransmitter that's released. So that means the more molecules of calcium you have, the more synaptotagmin can be bound, and the more synaptic vesicles can be released. You should now understand how calcium causes the fusion of synaptic vesicles onto the presynaptic bouton's membrane. This allows for the release of neurotransmitter. If you kept fusing synaptic vesicles without recycling them, your presynaptic bouton would become huge. One of the main mechanisms of vesicle recycling is clathrin-mediated endocytosis. The synaptic vesicle flattens out on the presynaptic bouton membrane and is then coated with clathrin and endocytosed. This synaptic vesicle can then fuse back with the multivesicular complex or the endosome and be made into additional synaptic vesicles. This entire cycle can take about a minute. Another mechanism for vesicle recycling is the so-called kiss and run technique. When the synaptic vesicle fuses, it opens just enough for the neurotransmitter to come out, it then refuses and buds off back into the cell. Many different substances can be used as neurotransmitters. One of the most common classes of neurotransmitters are the amino acid neurotransmitters. Glutamate is the main excitatory neurotransmitter. GABA is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain while glycine is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter in the spinal cord. The catecholamines are another common class of neurotransmitters. These include the main neurotransmitters for the autonomic nervous system, norepinephrine and epinephrine, as well as dopamine, which is involved in many things, including mood, reward, as well as movement. There are many different peptide neurotransmitters. These peptides are usually 3 to 30 amino acids long, they include the opioids, which met and kephalin is one example of. They also include the tachykinins, like substance P. 
peptide neurotransmitters are often co-released with other neurotransmitters like glutamate or GABA. Neurotransmitters bind to postsynaptic receptors. These receptors can either directly or indirectly alter the membrane potential of the postsynaptic cell. The neurotransmitter binds to its receptor like a lock into a key. Oftentimes, neurotransmitters can act on multiple receptors, and multiple receptors can be opened by multiple neurotransmitters, although the binding efficiencies will vary. The first main type of postsynaptic receptor are the ionic tropic receptors. Once bound by their neurotransmitter ligand, these ionic tropic receptors directly open ion channels and allow ions to flow either into or out of the cell. Metabotropic receptors are the second main class of neurotransmitter receptors. Following binding of the neurotransmitter to the metabotropic receptor, a G protein starts an intracellular signaling cascade. These receptors are often called G-protein coupled receptors. The intracellular signaling cascade can lead to a number of changes in the cell. They can directly open ion channels. They can change the phosphorylation state of the ion channel to alter the open probability of that ion channel. And they can also alter receptor trafficking to the membrane. Metabotropic receptor responses take a longer time to develop than ionotropic receptor responses, since the ionotropic receptors directly open ion channels. The metabotropic receptor response, though, can be more long-lasting and can be an amplified response. Since you're starting the signaling cascade, there are many steps where you can amplify the response. In future videos, we will be talking more about these postsynaptic receptors and their function and how they can be involved in things like synaptic plasticity. Now that we know how neurotransmitters are released and where their site of action is, we're going to talk about how you can turn off communication across synapses. You want synaptic communication to start when you want it and stop quickly so that you can have sharp differences in signaling. So the first way that you turn off synaptic transmission is to remove the calcium signal. If you do not have depolarization of the presynaptic bouton, you won't have calcium influx into the cell and binding to synaptotagmin and synaptic vesicle release. Second, you can somehow remove the neurotransmitter from the synaptic cleft. This is accomplished in a variety of ways. Some neurotransmitters can be reuptaken into the cell using special reuptake pumps. Some neurotransmitters are destroyed by an enzyme, for instance, acetylcholine is destroyed by acetylcholinesterase in the synaptic cleft itself. And finally, the neurotransmitter can just diffuse away from the synaptic uh, junction between the two cells. That concludes our video on synaptic transmission. Hopefully now you can identify and draw the main types of synapses found in the nervous system, describe the mechanism of synaptic vesicle release, and describe how neurotransmitters can cause a change in postsynaptic membrane potential.